we do raise our voices to you, Lord. We raise our worship to you, and we thank you, God, for the privilege of bringing you our praise today. In Jesus' name.
creation. There is no place higher than you. We worship your great and mighty name today. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father.
you, you know, it's, it's easy to get kind of, uh, our vision can be kind of short. You know, we just see what's happening in our lives this week or this year even, and the problems that we're facing, the challenges, maybe even the shortcomings in our own lives. It's easy to, for our focus to be on that. But, uh, you know, God is so big, and not only God's hugeness, but what we do Literally, what we do today, this week, this year, is so eternally important that it makes whatever is coming at us at this moment almost trivial in comparison. But what is important about what's coming at us at this moment is the way we respond to God, the way we live in faith or walk in faith today literally echoes through our life, through the people around us, through their lives, through eternity I'm going to read you a verse from Matthew, chapter 1, just one verse. I guess you can turn there if you want to, but it's, it's in the, the lineage of, of Christ, the genealogy. And a few verses down, verse 5, it says, Solomon fathered Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. And Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. King David was uh, the human picture of Jesus, the Messiah. He was the predecessor. He wrote so many of our Psalms and is actually an ancestor of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ in his, his physical line. And this woman, Rahab, that we're going to read about today is David's great-grandmother, and so when we read about her today, I want you to remember that when she's, she's going through what she's going through, and there's the spies in there too, we're going to read about them, you know, when they're going through what they're going through, they're not just fighting for themselves. She's not just fighting for herself. She's literally establishing something in faith with God that's going to echo through generations, and in her case, bless the whole world through one of her descendants one day, Jesus Christ. That's how important her decisions are that she's making. That's how important her being able to reach out and trust God in faith is. It's literally going to form the generations to come. That's powerful, isn't it? All right, let's begin here in Joshua chapter 1. We're just going to pick up in verse 10. Last week, we went over the first nine verses. I'm just going to read through quite a section here before we pause, probably. It says, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get provisions ready for yourselves, for within three days you will be crossing the Jordan. So if you're taking notes in your handout or somewhere else, that's pretty important to mark. Within three days you will be crossing the Jordan. So there's preparation happening. We talked about that last week when it comes to necessary preparations that we actually prepare our courage. Part of gaining courage to follow Christ is that uh, we're kind of preparing our lives for that by being in the Word of God, by getting our thinking straight when it comes to what our purpose on this planet is. We are kind of building our courage to be ready to say yes to Christ. You're going to go in and take possession of the land. The Lord your God is giving you to inherit. This is huge. Remember, God actually promised this land like 400 years prior to this to their ancestor, Abraham. 400 years. And in God's amazing plan, the, the corruption in that land had finally reached a place where God was like, we have to judge it now. And they had finally reached a place where they were ready to go in and God is bringing them in. Joshua said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, remember what Moses, the Lord's servant, commanded you when you said... The Lord your God will give you rest, and he will give you this land. Your wives, dependents, and livestock may remain in the land Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan, but your best soldiers must cross over in battle formation ahead of your brothers and help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he has given you. And they, t and they too possess the land the Lord your God is giving them. You may then return to the land of your inheritance and take possession of what Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on the east side of the Jordan. And so this is a story you can read about if you go back farther in the history, that they loved this land that they were in here on the far side of the Jordan. They were like, we want to inherit this land. 
And the only way that the, everybody agreed to that is if they came over and helped conquer the promised land with everyone else, and then they could go back and go ahead and settle this other area that they liked. They'd already destroyed the kings that were in this land they're talking about. Verse 16, or uh, is that 18? Yeah, 16. They answered Joshua, everything you have commanded us, we will do. Everything you send us, everywhere you send us, we will go. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses in everything. Certainly the Lord your God will be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words in all that you command him will be put to death. Above all, I want you to underline this, be strong and courageous. If you were here last week, we saw that repeated again and again in those first nine, three times in those first nine verses, and here it is again. And here's a truth on your handout. People need me to be strong and courageous. People need me to be strong and courageous. This is what we're going to see with Rahab. We're going to see this with these two spies that are sent into the land. Not just the people around me today even, but the people in the generations to come. What I do is going to echo throughout eternity. They need me to be strong and courageous. All right, so now let's begin in chapter 2. It gets a little more interesting here. We're going to talk, we're going to see the spies. Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, that's where they were camping in this forest, saying, go and scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left and they came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they came to investigate the entire land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So she said, yes, the men did come to me, but I didn't know where they were from. At nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out, and I don't know where they were going. Chase after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof, hidden them among the stalks of flax that she had arranged on the roof. The men pursued them along the road to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as they left to pursue them, the city gate was shut. All right. So we have these two spies entering into this foreign city, and especially in this time. This was, you know, the cities in this day were not like, most of them at least, were not like the cities we have today. If you had two foreigners enter pier, uh, you know, it wouldn't probably be known very quickly, even though we we're a small town, relatively. But if you had two foreigners enter Midland, South Dakota, it would be known immediately. The grapevine would begin, you know, it would be known right away, hey, who are these two Nigerians who are uh, living here in town, or whatever it was. You know, you would know right away, there's a couple people moved to town, because there's only like 75 people in town, you're going to know all about it. This is more of the dynamic, now Jericho was a larger town than that, but these people were not used to visitors, because most visitors were enemies, okay, most of the time. And so there occasionally be traders or merchants of some kind that would visit, but to just have people coming and going through the city, people would know about it. And so these two spies, now imagine you're these guys, and you're, there's two of you, you've been sent, and uh, you're, you're crossing the Jordan, all sneaky-like. Anybody ever play paintball? You do that? You play paintball? You people need to get out and have a life. <laughs> you're sneaking out there, you know, it's... Maybe they left in the cover of dark, you know, they're, they're sneaking around and they've crossed the Jordan and they've made it and they, they know the direction of Jericho and they, they, cro they cross a hill and they can see the city, a huge city in the distance and they're making their way up there and they're like trying to go all incognito and walking in the gates and they're like, what are we going to do? And, and they see this prostitute's house. And sometimes in that, you know, in different, in different parts of, of history, you know, prostitutes would have like a special symbol over their door, so everybody knew this is where the prostitute lived, or a certain section of town, or one way or another, they came to find out this is somewhere uh, where they could spend the night, they could go in there, and it would be, you know, it was out of the public eye, 
And so they're like, this is probably a pretty good place to go lay low. I doubt they were there for her services, is what I'm trying to say. It was more like an inn along with everything else going on. But, of course, word got out that they were there. And so there they are in the middle of a walled city. There's no one coming to their rescue. It's like they're an American left in Afghanistan or something. There's no one coming to their rescue, right? They're there alone, and these people are going to be, you know, probably worse to them than it would be if the Taliban sees Americans still hanging out. I mean, they still might let you get out of the country in Afghanistan, but these people were going to get killed for sure. Just two of them. All right, look at your neighbor and say, I don't think you cut out to be a spy. <laughs> Just tell them that. I don't think you're cut out to be a spy. These guys had guts. And more than that, Rahab, she probably knew when they came in there and were foreigners, and she certainly obviously knew. At some point before the king and his men or the king's soldiers came to check things out, she knew who they were, and she knew the dangers involved with having them in her house and taking care of them because she'd already hidden them when the soldiers arrived, right? She'd already taken them up to the roof and she had flax out there. They they would dry it on their roofs, the grain sometimes, you know, so it would have been harvested fairly recently and it would be drying on the roof and then they would thresh it. So she had the the stalks up there all drying and she's like, you guys get under here, you know, they're going to be coming and, or, you know, maybe she got word from her neighbor friends or whatever it was. She knew they were on the way and she hid them underneath these stalks of flax and went to that door. And today we're talking about faith in God, faith in a big God. But I want you to put yourself in her place for a moment. You've got two complete strangers. And the word has already gone out that these are our enemies. They want to kill us. Everybody knew this. And she brings him to her house, and then she knows that the authorities are coming to check it out. And something inside of her causes her to make the decision to, like, go, go whole hog for Yahweh, okay? For Yahweh, the God she doesn't know, but she's heard about. She heard the stories we're going to see in here. You know, she heard stories of them crossing the Red Sea. She heard stories about the kings that they had destroyed. This was back where those two and a half tribes wanted to stay. We're going to stay eventually. She'd heard these words, and she'd heard how maybe God took care of them for all these years in the wilderness. So she'd heard these things. Everyone was talking about them. Everyone was scared about them. And something inside of her, at some point, after she met these men probably, maybe after they were talking to her and asking her questions and maybe getting a meal at her house and staying there, something inside of her rose up. And she somehow came to the conclusion... I'm going to risk my life to try to hide these two guys who serve Yahweh, a God I've never known. This is unusual faith in God. There's a truth on your handout. Faith is in a big God is contagious. Here you are, Rahab, and two guys show up at your door saying, hey, we need a place to sleep tonight. Kind of a a quiet, out-of-the-way place here, corner of the city along the wall. Can we stay here? We've got some money. I'm sure they paid for their place or whatever. She brings them in, and they begin, to, they begin to talk and converse. She finds out these are two of the Israelites that are coming into the land. These two guys have come into the middle of a huge walled city with no backup, no way out, no plan, <laughs> okay? It's like in the movies, you go in without a plan. 
And because you're, you know, a superhero, you make it out okay. That's the movies. That's not real life. In real life, you don't go into the enemy walled city where you stand out like a Nigerian in Midland, South Dakota. You stand out with everything from the way you talk to the way you look, and you just walk in there hoping somehow you're going to find a way out. The only way you would do that is if you knew there really was someone backing you up. That was the faith of these two spies. They knew God had their back. God was with them. If God is with us, who can be against us? This was, this was the spirit being demonstrated by these two guys, that if God is for us, there's nothing we can't do. We were given an assignment by Joshua. Go check out the land, especially Jericho. I guess there's no better way to check out Jericho than to walk through the city gates and spend a night inside. Some people call that crazy, okay? But they were bold. Their faith was so bold that I'll bet you if they were talking to their friends before they left the Acacia Groves and they told their friends, man, I believe in God so much, I'm just going to walk up to Jericho. I'm just going to go walking up to the front of that city. I'm just going to walk right in and just be led by the Spirit of God and see what he does. How many of you know they would have had a whole bunch of friends that would have said, you guys are crazy. Oh, you're one of those crazy Yahweh followers, aren't you? You just believe in God to do these things? It's impossible. You can't just go walking into a city like Jericho with giant walls you could ride a chariot on and all. You can't just go right, walking into a city like Jericho, hope you find somebody who's going to be a friend. They hate us. They know we're coming. They're our enemies. But yet these two guys did it. Now, I want to tell you right now, the, if you've been a Christian a little while, it's easy to look at people sometimes who are excited about God or have big ideas about God and pat them on the head and say, oh, that's really cute. And part of the reason is because sometimes we get ideas, we, we think God has told us to do something and he hasn't. And if God hadn't told them, you're going into the promised land. If God wasn't with the plan, then it wouldn't have worked. Forty years earlier, some people tried this similar thing. They had re- the country had, the people had rebelled against God and God said, that's it, you're not going into the land. And a bunch of them said, well, we'll just, oh, we're so, we realize we made a mistake. We're just going to go in. And, you know, I think God's going to be with us. We, we knew his plan was for us to go in. Now he told us, no, but we're going to do it anyhow. And they were utterly annihilated by the locals. God was not with them. So how many of you know, just because you had a crazy idea in your head doesn't mean God's obligated to fulfill your plans right? So that's what we're dealing with sometimes. When we look at someone and we hear what they think God is telling them and we give them the, oh, isn't that cute, pat on the head. Sometimes it's just because we're human beings who are not God and, and we've seen the crazies, you know, <laughs> I have, you know, and so it's easy to think that God only works in certain ways. You know, God's only going to work through an army that's big enough and organized well enough and has the advantage on the battlefield, then, you know, God could give us the land. Well, that's just the same way any old country's army would work, right? If you can, now listen to this, if you can do what you're doing without God, maybe God's not even in it. Maybe you're just doing it. The, the very fact that it's beyond my ability often means, if, if I think I'm hearing God ask me to do that thing, often means this is the thing God wants me to do because he's into doing things that are beyond human ability. That could be in a ministry that you're faithful to for many years or a family that you keep caring about and seeing them come to Christ. It, it can be, it's just regular things. It doesn't have to be, you know, we're, we're going to the moon or, you know, I'm heading to Mongolia or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be that kind of thing. But it will be bigger than you can do on your own, or it's probably not God. It might be good. God might be with you as you do it, 
But God things, almost by their definition, are bigger than human things. Amen. Because we're talking about God, the creator of the whole universe. Why would he spend his time just sort of metaphorically doing things, meaning you're just doing things and saying it's God? He is into something much grander than that. He's saving the world. Amen. Even the changing of one heart softened toward God is a miracle that no human being can do. That is God working and doing something, a miracle beyond our ability. Somebody say amen. amen. So here's Rahab, and she sees these two spies. And I can just, I mean, it's, it's almost, you can almost see it there. Her faith growing. Like, how could these two guys come into our town? And they're going to spy out the land, and they're from Israel, and I know they're coming to attack us. And here they've come in by their own. You know, wow, I want to know this God. I want to serve this God. I've lived my entire life worshiping these gods of my own. I've got a spot here that I've grown up into or been placed into in my people. And how can I stand against my own people? But this is God we're talking about. I want to know and serve this God. It is contagious. Faith in God is contagious to the people around us. If nothing's happening around me, you know, day after day, week after week, year after year, I need my faith to grow. Amen. God, we just come before you right now. You are so big. God, you took these two spies into the land and you brought them out. And you even, all that you did, you saved Rahab too. God, you are so big. God, forgive us for thinking small Forgive us for not believing you when we see something in your word or we hear you leading us to do something or say something or believe you for someone to be saved or, or whatever it is. God, God, forgive us for thinking that way. God, we love you. We look to you, Jesus Christ. Thank you. You're saving the world. Thank you, God. God, we believe you in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. I'm just going to keep reading here so we don't go on too long here, all right? Verse 8. Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did in Sihon and Og and the two Amorite kings you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Wow. Now, please swear to me by the Lord that you will also show kindness to my father's family. You remember, every prostitute is somebody's daughter, right? Here they are, precious in the sight of the Lord. Because I showed kindness to you, give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother and brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and save us from death. The men answered her, we will give our lives for yours. If you don't report our mission, we will show kindness and faithfulness to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then she let them down by a rope through the window since she lived in a house that was built into the wall of the city. Go to the hill country so that the men pursuing you won't find you, she said to them. Hide there for three days until they return. Afterward, go on your way. So she's gone beyond just hiding them. Now she's actively working to see the will of God done in her way, the best way she can, all that she knows. She's not leading a Bible study. She doesn't even know enough about God, but she is with God. Her allegiance has been determined that her allegiance is now with God. 
She has said in her heart, all right, I'm God's. I belong to God. This is what it means to come to God. This is why every person has what it takes to come to God when he calls. Because when he calls, all you have to do, you don't have to know all things. All you have to do is turn to him and say, you are God. You are God. I'm going to follow you. You are my God. You're my God now. God, show me what you want. Whatever I have is now yours. I am following you. You are my God. And in this, she was saved. Here's the truth here. If I'm afraid to talk about God or do things for God, I need a bigger God. I need a bigger God. She realized this God is going to come in and take over this walled city. She realized this based on just stories she'd heard, the way God is working in her heart, and these two guys who were witnesses to her. But that was enough. Her faith was there to follow God. I read a great quote a couple weeks ago. Faith rests on who God is, what he has done, and what he will do. This is real faith. This is the faith that we need to encourage in each other, not discourage in each other. Even if someone says God wants them to do something and it looks, you look at them and say, I don't know if you can do that. Well, you just need to stop, take a step back and ask yourself this question, is God big enough to do that? The answer is yes, if it's a God thing. If it's something God is wanting to be done, God is big enough to do that. He often chooses the ugly, the unseemly, like David, her great-grandson. He chooses the, the one that no one expected many times, the one who's too young, the one who's just out with the sheep. That's David. He chooses that one so many times. Never look at a person who's who's trying to follow God, who's hearing God, who wants to do something that you know is a good God thing. Never look at them and say, well, you could never do that. Don't do it. Because what you're really saying is, God couldn't do that. And that leaves one of you, either you or God, a fool. Who do you think is going to end up being the fool? (laughs) It's not God. (laughs) It's me for thinking too small. Somebody say amen. All right, let's continue on. Another truth. Living like God is going to do what he said, he would, he would always looks ridiculous to someone. Remember that. It always looks ridiculous to someone. Uh, early on in my life, I learned a valuable lesson that has served me well. I was a teenager... And I really wanted to follow God, and I was imperfect in it, and many things I didn't know about God, but I really wanted to follow God well. And I would go to sometimes uh, like uh, summer church camps or youth retreats, things like this, and I would meet some youth, some teenagers who were like me, but they were kind of a minority, actually, even in a Christian getaway, you know, a Christian retreat or whatever. And then there would be some who were just young in their faith and didn't really know God yet, which is totally understandable. You know, you're getting to know God, or you've just got to know God. You don't know how to really walk with Him yet. Obviously, that's going to be the case, right? But then there was this other group, and I don't know how to describe them other than there were the cynics. And they were the group that they knew all about God or church, But there was something in their spirit, there was something in their attitude that it was like it was all a joke. It was like it was just, it was like rebelling against the man, you know, oh, the corporate, the corporate guys, you know. It was that kind of a feeling, but it's toward God. And I realized early on, just as a teenager, I realized these people are poison, (laughs) Okay, these people are poison. They often were the coolest, not always, but sometimes they were the coolest, and sometimes they had the, you know, they wore the latest styles of clothes, you know, on the, you know, many times they were, you know, successful, when you think of successful as a teenager, among teenagers, you know, cool or whatever, many times, not always, not always, but, but I realized early on, these people are poison. And I saw other kids, other people my age, 
you know, hang around with them. And over time, that same cynicism kind of rub off. You know, you got some kid who wants to know God, and he's hanging around these other kids are like, <laughs> and before you know it, he's thinking, oh, maybe I'm just a sucker to be so serious about God. You know, yeah, we all we know there's a God, but you know, it's okay if I fornicate around a little bit. It's okay if I cuss a little bit when nobody's listening. It's okay if I, you know, try to go do this and that, you know, teenage sin things, you know, whatever. You know, it's not that big a deal, you know. It's just, it's, it's like the rising of the sun, predictable to me now. Now, after all these years seeing it again and again, it's like a pattern. That I, could, I could see it. You know, it's like, it's like traffic lights. If you're a teenager and you're moldable and all your friends are like this, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, you're in trouble. So for my own kids, I would, you know, do whatever it took. There were sometimes we just like, you're not hanging around with them. I know they're nice kids, but you're not hanging around with them. <laughs> okay. And this is the reason. It's because this is a deadly thing for a Christian. Cynicism, refusing to actually believe in God, hanging around God but not believing in Him is the deadliest thing for a Christian. Early, later on when I was in college, um, actually this would be like a uh, seminary, I got to see uh, Christians at two different assemblies of God uh, undergrad schools. And I was, I was in the graduate school, so we occasionally allowed undergraduates to interact with us in some way. But, you know, looking at them, there were people in, in this case, it was a Bible school, and these were like all the hardcore followers of Jesus. They all wanted to be ministers, okay? This was some time ago. I'm kind of old, like dirt. But they all wanted to be ministers, and so they were like, not all of them, but most of them were like, you know, I want to be a missionary somewhere around the world. I want to be a pastor and see people come to Jesus Christ. So there was a large group of them there. I was like, that, that's cool. Awesome. And then there was another undergrad school, same denomination, Christian school. But instead of being filled with a lot of those kind of people, it was filled with a lot of people who just kind of like, I think, sent there by their mom and dad because uh, they wanted to have a Christian influence of some kind. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm saying? And the difference is night and day. The difference was... Somebody might go to the, the Bible school where the ministers are being trained, and maybe they were just kind of like knew a little bit about God, and they were, you know, a little bit on fire for God, but by the time they were done, man, they were ready to storm the gates of hell. And then these other people going to this other university, little college, I guess, you know, they get around the wrong friends, and all of a sudden they started out wanting to do something for God. Maybe they even went to a Christian school because they wanted to, you know, do good things for God, and maybe they were having a psychology degree or something else, but they were going to use it out in the workplace. You know? And by the time they got done, they are just this cold shell of a legalistic Christian, I guess you'd say, or whatever. I saw it again and again. And if there's one thing I want to learn, okay, as I grow in Christ... It's that sometimes the people that seem the smartest and the coolest, at least in their own eyes, are fools. They're fools. To, to hang around God and not believe that he is a big God and not walk in faith with him and reach out with him for all that he has said, to not do that is to walk the path of the fool. God is saving this world. God is saving us. The kingdom of God has come. The harvest is ripe. It doesn't matter how many people, you might, you might look at some preachers on TV and say, oh, it's all a scam. You might, you might have had some background, some, some issue with a church sometime. You're like, these people were fake or these people didn't, uh, didn't hold the ground. You know, they, they served God for a while, and I was with this person, and now they're just kind of off in la-la land. You know, whatever might happen, 
Our God is so big that to walk any path other than radical belief and faith in Him is the path of a fool. Amen. Amen. So where are you at today? What are you doing today? Could God send you out like one of these spies? Are you like Rahab? When, when you hear and understand that God is real and wants to change my life, are, will you take a hold of that truth and do something and say, yes, that's my God. I'm just, you know, here I'm just a, a hooker, been saved a half hour here, but uh, I believe in God. So everything I have, I'm going for God with what I've got. Will you do that? That is the path of wisdom. Because a, a time is coming, just a little bit here in, in, in the book, Joshua here, where you're going to see God do something at Jericho that had never been seen before. And those huge, thick walls are going to come falling down, and the armies of Israel charge that city and slaughter those people, all except for that one woman and her family, Rahab. And when that day come, there was no question who was wise. To take those risks, she was so wise. She, in her somewhere, was her great-grandson, David, the king of all Israel. If she hadn't done this, God still would have done his thing. Remember, God told Moses at one point, I'm done with these people. I'm going to kill them all, and I'm just going to start over with you, and you'll raise up a new nation, and I'll send him. And Moses was like, God, please have mercy. <laughs> so you understand, she had a choice. She didn't have to do this. But God opened her eyes, and she responded in faith. And God changed a whole bunch of generations and blessed all of us through this woman of faith. Amen. All right. Final truth here. Every time I actually step out in faith, my faith in God grows stronger. I'm just going to pick it up with uh, verse 22. The two men went into the hill country and stayed there three days until the pursuers had returned. They'd searched all along the way but did not find them. Then the men returned, came down from the hill country and crossed the Jordan, and they went to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported everything that had happened to them. And Joshua said, the Lord, they, they told Joshua, I'm sorry, they told Joshua, the Lord has handed over the entire land to us. <laughs> That's faith. The walls are still standing. A city full of soldiers on alert. God's handed them over to us. Everyone who lives in the land is also panicking because of us. Joshua started early the next morning. Look at how the, look at how the faith, look at how it grows. Look how Joshua, he's encouraged here. Look, look how mm. Joshua started early the next morning and left the Acacia Grove with all the Israelites, and they went as far as the Jordan and stayed there before crossing. Pack it up right there. All right, just bow your head with me. God Almighty, you are so amazing. Lord God, when our own country and our early heritage was an absolute sin-filled, dangerous place to be, cesspool, God, you sent an awakening into our land. And you did it again, a second great awakening. God, when we had, we out here in the West, it was Wild Wild West, it was just a terrible place to be, a place you wouldn't want to raise a family. And God, you sent an awakening all across our land. Thank you, Jesus. God, you changed the Roman Empire into a place where Christians flourished and people faked being a Christian so they could be accepted. God, you changed that completely. God, you have saved again and again people who turn to you. And God, the saving of our nation now, our world now, God, it is not a big thing for you. You are the big thing in the room. You are God. And so God, we refuse to be afraid, to love in your name, to speak the truth in your name, to reach out to bet our lives on the fact that you're coming through. 
that you want to move and work in people's lives, that you want to save people, that you want to change generations because of the choices, because of the response of people to you when you call them. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. God, we believe you. God, we believe you to save the people around us, our families. God, we believe you to save even the church, your church here, from compromise and confusion, from weakness. God, we believe you, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, with you, nothing is impossible. God, the world is crying out to us. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. God has given us the peoples of the earth as an inheritance. Inheritance for the Lord. that They would know him, love him. God, thank you. We thank you. We praise you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. If you're in this place and you don't know God, this is your moment. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. The Bible is really clear. A majority of people will never follow God, really follow him, because you have to give up your life. You have to leave your old life behind and follow Jesus, just like his disciples we read about. But if you do, all those that he calls, all those that respond and follow him, none of them will be put to shame. He will not turn a single one away. It doesn't matter where we've been or where we've come from or how weak we feel. Turning to him and saying, you are my God. Save me. It means you become one of his people. If, if you're in this place and that's your desire, just pray with me. Jesus, save me. God, I want to know you and follow you. Whatever you lead me, I want to go. Thank you, God, for showing me who you are, for sending witnesses into my life, for opening up your word a little bit so I can understand that, that you love me and that you're working right now and that you call me to be yours. God, I'm just responding with yes, yes, yes. Thank you, God. Save me. Thank you, God. If you're in this place and you've let cynicism, cynicism, you know, sarcasm toward God, a little bit of hardness, a little bit of lack of expectation that God's really going to do something, if you've let that creep into your heart right now, just repent to God. It's a killer. It sucks the spiritual life out of us. It doesn't mean we're fools. It doesn't mean we believe everything everyone says. But God is greater than we could, he does things greater than we could ask or imagine. The true God, when he truly speaks, there is nothing he will not do. Just repent of that, that hardness in the heart, that attitude for him. Say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for trying to, you know, look a little cooler or not get my expectations disappointed. God, whatever I'm saying in my mind, whatever I've said, God, I'm so sorry. Lord, you want to do miracles around me right now. God, you want to you save people and change lives and heal people and transform marriage. God, you want to do all these things, and you're ready. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. God, give me the heart of a child to believe what you've said, to simply take you at your word and come to you just as you've said. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in your precious name. Thank you, Jesus.